Hey everybody, what's up? I'm Connor. This is Jam Chats. Uh, today I'm on here with Dr. John Petroselli from New Jersey. He's a saxophonist and he's the now acting director of the University of Utah's jazz program. My former band director. How are you doing today, John? I'm doing great, man. Thanks so much for having me on today. Yeah, no problem. I really wanted to have you on here. I really kind of wanted to see how things are going on at school since I've left and how things are going with you. I know that you've had like a composition that came out and kind of just what you're doing with school and you, you know, as the director and like what you're doing aside from that. So, uh, but also kind of just to let everybody who is not aware of who you are and kind of aware of the figures of the different genres of the music scene here in Salt Lake or Northern Utah are to be able to kind of like you know, just kind of get to know you and connect a little bit more. That's kind of my whole purpose with this podcast is to be able to kind of spread the word a little bit, right? So, yeah, so glad to have on you on here. <clears throat> so, uh, I think I just wanted to start with like a bit of a background, right? Uh, Good. Yeah, just like what have you been kind of doing the past few days, actually? Let's just kind of start with that uh, before we go into the background. For sure, man. So, um, past few days have been super busy, actually. Yeah. I gave a presentation for the UMEA uh, conference. The Utah Music Educators Association holds an annual conference. Uh, this year, obviously, due to the COVID-19 restrictions, it was completely virtual. Right. And I gave a presentation entitled fundamental rhythmic and melodic loops for beginning improvisational group. Um, and essentially the focus is um, addressing a concern uh, and, and need that I have often encountered, you know, over the past year and a half, I've been giving um, free master classes at the high school and junior high school level yeah. here in Utah, um, essentially as a outreach and recruiting um, on behalf of the University of Utah's jazz program, trying to get to know each of the band directors uh, locally within the state uh, that run jazz programs, and of course, you know, connect on a personal level to uh, students who may very well be applying to our jazz program up at the U, right? And one of the major uh, questions uh, or, or concerns even that I've gotten from band directors locally is, you know, I'm teaching in a jazz ensemble environment, typically, you know, 16 to maybe even 20 students at a time. Um, how do I, you know, rehearse the music, right? Like get concert ready music re um, together while at the same time teaching students improvisation. And oftentimes, right, it seems like sort of, um, goals that are at odds with each other yeah. because on the one hand you're trying to rehearse music you know on the other hand you're trying to teach students individual skills right and to be creative right in an individual way with those skills um and so what ends up happening right is typically at that level you get maybe like three or four soloists right in a band and then there's like 16 people right who maybe have never gotten a chance right. to though they've been in a jazz ensemble for three or four years, right? Yeah. So, um, essentially, I've, I've been putting together this uh, system um, and it's going to hopefully result in a book uh, in the next couple months um, that it's essentially uh, like a class-by-class -class system um, that takes somewhere between 10 to 15 minutes. And the goal is at the end of an 18-week cycle, that every member of the band can play, can take it, can take a improvisation on a basic twelve-bar blues, right? Um, and so, you know, that's not to say that there aren't students in that band who could already do that. You know what I mean? But we're essentially trying to teach to the bottom, right? Like, make sure that like every you're, you're trying to raise the bar a little bit. That way, you kind of make it a little bit easier for the students that. I just probably wouldn't even take the liberty of trying to like have their extraneous extra skills of improv 
you know, sharpening those tools or whatever. And uh, you want to encourage them to do it anyway. And so you're kind of just like setting the bar and I can kind of see how you're doing that. So, yeah. I mean, I, I've never, I was never in a high school jazz band setting. So I, I, I wasn't, I'm not quite informed on what the whole process is like, but this is, you know, I can imagine. Well, I mean, even at the college level, right? Like, I mean, in the context of the jazz ensemble, it's really hard to try and like work on improvisational skills, right? With individual people, while at the same time trying to, you know, get through, you know, what's often times like a massive amount of repertoire. <laughs> I mean, you know, so I think it's a, you know, it's a worthwhile endeavor to try and find a way to, to split the difference in a more equitable way, um, especially for students who might not have access, for instance, to private lessons or educational resources, you know, that are gonna give them that skill set outside of the band context. Um, so that happened. <laughs> uh, let's see, what else happened? I, um, had a um, really productive conversation. I'm also the UMEA All-State um, uh, performer and uh, composer in residence this year. So I'm putting together a set of three uh, original compositions of mine uh, for you know high school big band. Um, we're gonna put together you know full uh, professional quality you know recordings um, and and videos. Uh, and so that process is starting in a couple of weeks. So I'm just, you know, trying to get that all off the ground. Uh, and then there's also a um, really amazing duo project, which I'm a part of uh, with my collaborator, uh, longtime friend, um, Gustin Rudolph, who's a drummer. Um, and we went to the studio a couple weeks ago now uh, for essentially a, a first pass through some m m uh, musical material. And uh, so we're starting to get into the editing phase of some of that. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a busy time for sure. Was this here in Salt Lake that you did that or, or you weren't, are you, you're not in Salt Lake right now? I'm in Salt Lake right now, um, but I went back to uh, the East Coast uh, for okay. a couple over the over the winter break. Um, quarantine on both ends, staying safe, of course. But uh, while I was there, I got a chance to go into the studio, uh, recording studio in Philadelphia with Gustin. And uh, we are hoping to do probably two or three more recording sessions to that'll ultimately yield uh, the final product for this collaboration. That, that's amazing. Yeah, I'm excited to hear about that. You know, whenever that, and how, how, soon can we anticipate that releasing um it's really going to depend i think on when i'll be able to get back to the east coast again really? so, yeah uh you know i mean I'm, I'm hoping that sometime in uh may or early june i'll be able to get back to the studio uh with Gustin, and so you know hopefully you know mid mid 2021 essentially you know to um but actually, um, I've got a, a recording available of that first collaboration. I'd be happy to share. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Cool. Let's see if I can pull it up. Was not planning on. <laughs> no, I, I just it's. I, I wasn't anticipating you bringing up some news like this, but I just remember your video of Inner Urge with Steve Lyman, and I like that so much. So I just like am actually genuinely interested in when your next release is. So cool. Um, yeah. So actually, you know, that format for me, I've, I've always felt super creative in uh, just the drum saxophone yeah. format. Um, Let's see if I can share screen. Yes, I can. Perfect. All right. I'll just maybe play a little, just a little, you know, taster of this. Maybe not the, the whole thing. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
No, that was awesome. I, I, I really, it's like, especially with, without any sort of like, kind of, kind of like harmonized instrument, right? Without any kind of bass or piano or guitar to kind of like outline any sort of chord structure, you're left with this kind of like, what, what am I supposed to pay attention to and like, listen to? And that's, that was an awesome presentation of like, how I who I should be listening to, you know. What was your Gaston, Gustin is what was his name? Yeah, his name is Gustin Rudolph. G Gustin really? Rudolph. Yeah, I, 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 it was you know at the beginning of the composition, you kind of took the spotlight, and then he slowly kind of built up, and then it was kind of, it was as if the spotlight was taken on by him, and I was like paying a little bit more attention to what he was doing as you were kind of playing this kind of arpeggiated vamp that wasn't something that needed as much more attention. Uh, you know, there's just these kind of like faceted details that I m maybe, you know, uh, anybody who listens to this might just hear that it's noise or music, but they won't be able to really understand it on like the depth that you're creating it on necessarily if that makes sense like if is there anything you want to kind of like share on on that experience if you if you understand what i mean i think i do i so the the background behind behind this collaboration actually dates back now nearly 10 years um essentially Gustin and I used to be uh, instructors at a jazz, a summer jazz camp, and uh, it was a day long camp. And then in the the, the early evening, uh, the two of us would kind of just stick around afterward, and we would just play a duo together. Um, for I mean, and this is for years that we would yeah. you know, year after year, and um, you know, in the meantime. You know, I've released three albums. He's been a part of. He's been a part of each album. We've toured globally together. You're right. So there's a, a really like long musical uh, connection that we've developed. Yeah. So there's we different arcs. You're there's yeah. There's multiple arcs you have with him. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so at a certain point um, in the last you know couple of years, we started playing uh, improvising free you know so you know there was no tune anymore yeah, you know right we we're just we we're improvising free but you know Gustin's foundation is in time right like mm -hmm. i mean he plays in a lot of r&b groups a lot of like contemporary jazz groups so when i say free i don't mean that it's rhythmically free i actually mean that it's melodically and like harmonically free in time mm -hmm. um, more, more essentially coming out of like miles davis second quintet than necessarily like for instance late period john coltrane um so you know 
the like from my perspective my goal is to be literally spontaneously composing both melody and structure in response to the time that he is mm -hmm. laying down right um and so what ends up happening is like you know in in that example um you know like i went into that uh, particular improvisation thinking i am an arpeggiator <laughs> that was my thought process i am an arpeggiator you know and so uh you know what does that call for right well i mean you know sequential melodic ideas right oftentimes repeated um and without pause right so that becomes a texture right um and through circular breathing right I'm able to execute that as a saxophonist, you know, to a greater or lesser extent, de depending on your evaluation, right, of how I did. But yeah, no, circular breathing. Explain that to anyone who wouldn't understand what that would mean. So, uh, you know, the limitation of any, any woodwind player, right, is that when you reach the end of the breath, you cannot sustain the tone anymore, right? So, I mean, you know, you're you're limited by how long. Uh, you can sustain your air support through the instrument. Um, but, you know, in certain uh, like woodwind traditions, uh, particularly from the African continent and um, uh, particular uh, East Asian uh, musical traditions, uh, you know, musicians, woodwind players have found ways over the years to continue to like uh, sustain the airflow through their instrument without taking their mouth off of the instrument. So in other words, you there are ways, uh, you know, it's and it's referred to as circular breathing where essentially you can continue to sustain, push air into your instrument while breathing through your nose. Yeah. Um, and the airflow isn't interrupted because essentially you store some air in your cheeks and then you expel that air so that you try and essentially mask the fact that you're breathing through your trachea at the same time. Um, so, uh, you know, the better, the better you are at covering that breath with your, the air that you expel through your cheeks, the, the more it's going to sound like one inter, uninterrupted. Yeah, some kind of just like circular cyclic breathing. That's, that makes sense. That's, yeah. Beat me, but yeah, like the inhale and exhalation through your mouth and like keeping it coming in through your nose. Yeah, that's, uh, I'm not so focused on my breathing when I'm playing guitar. I mean, but there are kind of like some breathing aspects about guitar that if if I'm just kind of relaxed, that's mainly just, I think I'll be, be okay for the most part. But some parts I just really need to kind of like take a deep breath when I have the opportunity or something like that. But no, that's very interesting because I, I, I had heard the term circular breathing, but I hadn't known specifically or had it explained to me so, or known how difficult it is to kind of pull off. So thank you for that. So Yeah, it's, it's kind of a fascinating area uh, because concentrating on that by itself is obviously quite difficult, right? You know, for instance, um, and you can, and you know, there's Guinness Book of World Records. I believe Kenny G is, is still, you know, the record holder. I think somewhere over over 45 minutes on a single note, just in making sure that the the, the note never stops. Yeah. Um, now you know, to me, the the compelling thing about circular breathing has always been sustaining a line, right? So in other words, like getting you know having an idea for a line, but then having to stop because you ran out of air. You know, if you're a guitarist or a pianist, right? Like you never have to worry that your phrasing is going to outlast your ability to sustain your breath, right? So to me, circular breathing is the solution to that. Uh, the way I apply circular breathing is, you know, I am using circular breathing to the extent that I'm able to execute the length of the line that I'm intending on playing. Um, but it, I mean, obviously, it's used in a variety of different ways, right, for different reasons. But, you know, my personal application is I'm trying to use it toward the musical goal of 
my phrase length, you know, and in this situation, right, like I'm trying to sustain an arpeggiated texture, right? Um, and if I can, if I can keep that texture consistent enough, then what, then that gives Gustin something to play against, right? Like he gets to paint against that, against that texture. Um, because, because I'm the one being consistent. Yep. It's kind of interesting, right? Because it's usually the drummer who needs to be the consistent mm -hmm. one. And I, we try and like pass those responsibilities back and forth as best as we can. Yeah, that's, that's, uh you know that's that's awesome like i is the whole kind of like the aspect of trading the spotlight is how i was kind of using it you know, was, but uh definitely about the drummer being in the spotlight for once and uh in a duo situation that seems to happen i also i watch a ben wendell's videos all the time and he always has like uh drummers on there and doing duos with friends and he's doing standards with friends and has some like drummers on there and it's just saxophone uh drummer duo and it's it's just like a run through of a standard and it's it's just really interesting the whole dynamic and the whole orchestration is just super interesting and how to make it musical instead of feeling like there's parts missing like a bass player or a guitar player or something like that right but that's you know there's no rules you know it doesn't feel like there's rules when you can pull off something like that so yeah i mean you know it's interesting that you so the way I always try and interpret that is there are there are always there are always rules. We just don't always know that we're abiding by them. You know what I mean? Like I, I think about that all the time because you know there are no written rules of music, right? Like there, you know the U, the U.S. government doesn't have a, a code of conduct that all musicians yeah, abide by. Not not written law, and we're not going to be sent to prison if we don't play in four four or three four. Or but but we hold ourselves right as individuals and as groups, and then I think even as like communities, we hold ourselves to certain rules. We we put ourselves into boxes all the time every time we pick up the instrument we accept a certain you know set of, of rules and limitations um and if we don't acknowledge that those are there then we can never break them right right because we don't even know that we're that we're inside of it mm -hmm. you know it's only when we acknowledge the borders and boundaries that we can think about how to push past them or if we want to at all that, that makes a lot of sense and uh yeah i'm definitely gonna be on the lookout for those other composition videos you know so that's exciting i want to jump into your background a little bit right now and we can make this kind of quick and brief and kind of just run through your musical career as a saxophonist as a band director as a composer um yeah, just if you want to kind of start from like maybe when you started playing saxophone, I, I kind of want to hear the story uh, about why you switched from alto to tenor. <laughs> right. Uh, well, I started playing the saxophone when I was maybe like around seven, seven years old, something, something like that. Six to seven, I would say. My dad put the horn in my hand. Uh, you know, he was a, a, a semi-professional saxophonist in the New York, New Jersey area, um, and he studied with Frank Foster, who was his main teacher when he was at Rutgers University. Uh, um, so, I mean, you know, he had, and still has, I would say, probably one of the most extensive vinyl collections of jazz music that I've ever seen in person. A really <laughs> amazing completist when That's it comes awesome. to, to listening to, to jazz. Um, and he's like one of my go-to sets of ears when I want, you know, feedback on something. I mean, yes, because he's my dad, but also just because I know that like he's listened to so much music that he's going to be able to like put it into context in terms of what he's heard. He's uh, you trust where you know it's there's not a dad bias. You can trust his opinion on that. Yeah. I mean, you know, obviously he's my yeah. dad, but 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 it's you have the other kind of factual you know super advanced set of ears you know just having listened to so much music in his lifetime um so yeah he was my first teacher uh and you know when i was maybe 
you know, 10-ish years old, he started bringing me out to jam sessions and different, you know, club dates in uh, the New Jersey area. You know, I'm born in, in Trenton and, you know, spent, you know, my sort of childhood growing up, you know, all over the state. And uh, one of the musicians that he got me in with, essentially, you know, that I got introduced to was Richie Cole, who was a really fabulous alto saxophonist who passed away this past year, unfortunately. Um, but Richie gave me, you know, a remarkable set of opportunities to play with him and to, to learn his music. Um, and I ended up playing, you know, at a, a bunch of different festivals, you know, from a really early age, and, you know, 11, 12 years old, you know, I was playing the Trenton Jazz Festival, you know, a bunch of different, um, you know, big, you know, events, you know, in that area. Um, and then, you know, fast forward to, to high school, I started doing the uh, New Jersey Performing Arts Center Jazz for Teens program, getting connected with uh, some, you know, really heavy players, you know, on the New York, New Jersey scene, like Bruce Williams was one of my main teachers there. Uh, Don Braden, you know, was running the program at the time. And um, let's see, I... Uh, ended up going to the University of Virginia for undergrad. Um, my main teacher there uh, was John Durth, who was just an incredible trumpet player. Um, you know, played with Thad Jones, Mel Lewis Orchestra, played with, uh, uh, you know, Boots Randolph. I mean, a ton of, just a ton of, you know, like really heavy musicians. And he was a part of the loft jazz scene in the 1970s with people like Dave Liebman, Michael Brecker, you know, Bob Berg, um, you know, he, he was a part of that loft scene where, you know, there was a lot of risk taking, a lot of experimentation with sort of the, the fundamental structures, you know, that we think of when we think of jazz during that time period. Um, so, I, you know, he was an amazing band leader and gave me a ton of opportunities, both at the school, but then also just in the like professional larger, you know, Virginia, DC music community. Right. Um, and John was, you know, the reason that I got introduced to Terrence Blanchard. Um, and Terrence, when he heard me, you know, invited me to move to New Orleans and uh, pursue my, um, you know, pursue my study of music, uh, you know, with him and the Monk Institute um, and, um, I've jumped over your, your question though. I'm sorry. I was, I started on alto. You're right. Um, yeah. No, the, the, why you switch to tenor. Yeah. That's fine. Totally. Yeah. I, uh, I interject and then pick up where you left off. Yeah. No, I'm sorry about that. So I, uh, to answer your question, I, so I started on alto saxophone. I mean, most people do, I would say even today. Um, and I, uh, uh, I was, Let's see. I was at a concert for um, the Woody Herman Ghost Band, um, and uh, one of the the tenor players in the band um, asked me to play something. I brought my horn with me. And when I was done, he uh, he told me, "Hey, man, um, you know you're too big for the alto saxophone." Essentially, yeah. I had grown like seven inches, yeah. I and mean, this was probably like. I was probably like 15 or 16 yeah. I was like, well, at the time. <laughs> he was like, Hey man, that's that, al that alto looks like a soprano on you. You gotta, you gotta upgrade essentially and make it more proportional looking. The aesthetic of how it looked like you said that, like, uh, yeah, it just looked proportionate to how, but, but, but like, if you put a soprano on somebody else, then it would look like a soprano on somebody else. Yeah. So. It was hilarious, man. I mean, the whole, re yeah. I mean, but it really resonated with me at that moment. Like at the time that was like, oh man, okay. Do it. Yeah. Jump. Do it. Yeah. Gotta, gotta make the switch. So I switched to tenor. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, it's really hilarious. Yeah. Because now, you know, I'm six, five and like people mistake my my tenor for an alto so i just i can't yeah. escape really. should have should have made the jump to barry and just yeah. play, apparently but <laughs> it's just one of those things man um but yeah where were you on the i had moved i was about to so i moved to new orleans on terrence blanchard's advice essentially <laughs> and i don't know that he i don't know that he 
you know, sometimes you tell people things they don't, you know, like how many times do they actually follow through on it, right? right. I, yeah, yeah. I definitely think he was surprised <laughs> to see me show up. But essentially my junior year of college, I picked up everything and moved to New Orleans. Yeah. And uh, I took some classes at Loyola University down there. Um, Terrence got me hooked up with uh, Delphio Marsalis's Uptown Jazz Orchestra. Um, started sitting in with Ellis Marsalis at Snug Harbor. You know, I got just super patched into that scene. And thankfully, I also got set up with a, a, a two-night-a-week gig at the House of Blues opening up for the Dirty Dozen. Oh, yeah? Yeah, so I, I got the, ch the chance to put, put a band together um, and, like, uh, you know, like a set band performing two nights a week every every week um, nice. two thursdays uh for several years actually i mean it was so <laughs> it sounds unheard of it sounds it sounds unbelievable just because looking now knowing what i know about you know the pandemic and everything thinking about even just having like the chance to perform is yeah crazy. like to think about having the opportunity to play twice twice a week and you know and obviously you know in generations past having you know a five night a week gig was like a thing you know what i mean not that mm -hmm. long ago so you know it's it's just really you know it's really interesting to think about how things have changed generation over generation um and you know what new opportunities are available and what opportunities have sort of receded, you know, um, at the same time. But, you know, that time in New Orleans was really formative and um, deeply important to my concept, uh, personally as an artist, but then also my recognition too of, you know, the fact that there are multiple strains of what we think of in terms of jazz, like the music and jazz history. I mean, you know, each community, every city has its own history, most of which is never told, you know, in quote unquote history books, you know, and, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of cities have like lineages of families, right? Like, you know, people who have, um, you know, maintained their name, like over, you know, many generations of musicians over the years. Right. The Marsalis family is a great example, but I mean, that's just... You know, that's a New Orleans family at the end of the day. I mean, there are Pittsburgh families, you know, there are Miami families, you know, Los Angeles families, etc. You know, and a lot of times, you know, you don't know that those lineages and histories exist until you go like embed yourself into them. Um, and fortunately, I've had the privilege of being able to, you know, literally move around the country over the last, you know, 15 years to, to get, you know, my feet wet at least a little bit you know, in a lot of the major scenes. Um, so anyway, I, I, I decided, you know, uh, when I was in New Orleans, I really wanted, I had kind of re reached a turning point where I wanted to continue my education. And um, I ended up uh, attending Rutgers University, coming back home in a sense, um, to do uh, master's degrees in jazz performance at Mason Gross School of the Arts with uh, Ralph Bowen, Stanley Cowell, Conrad Herwig, Charles Tolliver, and of course, Victor Lewis were my main teachers there. And, and Ralph was my main saxophone teacher. And then um, at the same time, I was studying in the Jazz History and Research Program, which is a Master of Arts degree run by, uh, at the time, it was run by Lewis Porter and Henry Martin um, out of the Newark campus. So I was pursuing two master's degrees simultaneously there playing in New York as much as I possibly could and gigging, you know, writing my own music. Um, um, and then when I, when I graduated in 2013, um, I kind of looked around, I actually moved to New York. Um, I got my uh, Pro Tools operators license. I was kind of like prepared to kind of freelance it, you know, and just yeah. my shot essentially in New York. Um, uh, but I got the opportunity uh, to do a teaching fellowship at University of Pittsburgh and got this really amazing opportunity to, to study with Jerry Allen. And I just left at the opportunity. So in 20, 2015, 
2014, somewhere in there. <laughs> I went, I, I moved out to Pittsburgh. I was also really intrigued by like getting a chance to, to live and work in Pittsburgh because, right. you know, Art Blakey came out of there, um, you know, Ahmad Jamal, mm -hmm. Pittsburgh, you know what I mean? Some really amazing hard bop musicians came out of Pittsburgh and I just kind of wanted to immerse myself in that culture. Um, and then of course, you know, study with Jerry Allen, you know, that was, no, oh, yeah, that's you know, seems uh, like a good selling point for sure. So for sure. So I, um, spent five years in Pittsburgh and, uh, taught at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, that was my first teaching job after, after the PhD. Oh, I'm sorry. That was my PhD. Right. It was PhD in music at university of Pittsburgh. Um, and then, you know, in the meantime, recorded my first album, um, wrote a book, <laughs> and um, started teaching at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, was my first teaching gig after graduating, uh, running a saxophone studio, and um, I ended up getting a grant through the National Endowment for the Arts for uh, my second my second recording project, uh, Presence. Uh, the way I, I recorded the way my first album in twenty fifteen. And Presence uh, came out in 2018. Okay. Um, essentially, it was a series of um, live performances, like live in, in concert uh, recording sessions uh, with about a 250, 300 person audience each night. Uh, full jazz quintet plus strings. Um, and then, let's see, I went to, I moved to Tulsa and got my first like full-time teaching position at uh, Northeastern State University, director of jazz position. Um, went on a, uh, a, yeah, went on a, a national tour for presence that year as well. Um, oh, and I had, and you know, for the way I had actually gone on a, an Asian tour of, uh, of China, Hong Kong, and oh, nice. you know, a couple other places. Let's see. And then I came out here um, uh, in 20. Sounds like, yeah, that brings us to 2019, 2019, fall 2019. Yeah, I, I, I came on board in, in 2019 um, as the, um, you know, as a visiting visiting professor in the, the jazz area. Uh, and then this past year, I got uh, renewed as visiting director of jazz. So that brings us up to today. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just kind of want to talk a little bit how that's going, you know, since I left, uh, I know that for me personally, switching over, you know, to like online in my last semester was kind of, yeah, it was just interesting. That's all I'll say. It was kind of like a blessing in disguise for me, but it was still really weird. You know, my senior recital having to play a live stream to an empty crowd, you know, that was kind of surreal, but uh, it's whatever. Um, you know, but I, I kind of just want to know what it's like teaching and how, I think the last time we talked about this, you said you've kind of gotten a grasp on it from when it happened, like right away, you know, and that how last fall was like a little bit, like, I, I don't know, it was it, it, like kind of easy, I guess, easier than I thought. You, you just said, you, you said you had a grasp on it. You know, I think every educator on the planet was sort of left scrambling when lockdowns and you know, restrictions for in-person um, meetings took place. And, you know, fortunately, at, I mean, at least at Utah, I, I, don't, I know a lot of educators weren't as lucky to get, you know, an extent, we got an extra 24 hours. So they, they, they canceled yeah. the first day back from spring break. Right. To give teachers like a little bit more time. Yeah to make the jump online. I mean, no doubt it's a completely different skill set. I mean, you know, managing, managing a, a class uh, in, in a completely virtual format um, demands a, a different set of skills uh, than managing a, an in-person class. And um, I, I would say that I have strengths and weaknesses on both sides of that equation, you know, as, as does everyone, no one, no one is a, is a perfect pedagogue, right? right. Um, I would say that my goal has just been um, 
to 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 get measurably better semester to semester. Right. So, you know, I mean, whereas in the spring of 2020, my goal was to survive. You know, I just want to survive this semester. Yeah. You know, continue to provide as positive and engaging and an experience as possible uh, while while making sure that my course content doesn't suffer right was sort of my my major priorities of of spring 2020 whereas fall 2020 you know i obviously we had more time to to kind of you know adjust and also find out what worked and didn't work right from the spring right you know because we got feedback essentially from half a semester's worth of online teaching. Um, so I went into the fall having, I would say, a, a general sense of um, the things that needed to improve and some of the things that I wasn't going to be able to get better at. Like, you know, for instance, you know, there are just some fundamental obstacles that can't be overcome in running a jazz ensemble in a completely virtual environment, oh, right? Yeah. Particularly with the rhythm section, right? The engagement of the bass and drummer is an in-person activity yeah. <clears throat> that cannot be replicated in the same way in an online format or even a like a virtual recording session for format. You're not going to have the same kind of rhythmic uh, lock can't yeah it's just you might be able to or i i don't know you won't be able to physically feel the bass player or you or physically feel the drummer right next to you and i know for them that's important and you can orally try and like pick it out you know but it, it, that feeling won't be there you know absolutely so i think um i think it, you know for me the fall semester was I was focused on how to minimize the weaknesses in that delivery system. Um, but what what the fall 2020 semester started to show me was that there were some real strengths to the format that I could exploit. You know, that there that that it wasn't all bad, essentially. Right, yeah. That there are actually things about teaching virtually that are better than teaching it in person. Um, and for me, one of the main ways that, that it's better is in terms of um, the composition and theory sequences. I'm actually finding that having the online platform to me is better than in-person classes in, in, in some regards because you have instantaneous access to you know, your recordings, right, to all of your uh, composition software, your DAWs, right, and you can right. move, you can move between these different formats a lot quicker than if you're like standing in the classroom. Um, and the other real advantage is that it's not, you're not the only one behind, you know, with access to all these uh, tools, all of your students are in this virtual space with you and everyone is in their own setup with access to all of their tools. Um, where you can kind of just see and kind of, yeah, everybody can kind of is really kind of in depth and connected with each other's. Yeah. It's really kind of uh, intuitive. Yeah. You know, to me, I think that for those tracks in particular, it, it seems to me to be better actually than like everyone entering the classroom sort of like leaving most of our, you know, equipment at the door, right? Like we're at home in this, you know, in our respective studios, right? And then we're kind of coming to class with like, you know, only, you know, maybe like a fifth of what we actually use at home. So instead, right, like we're coming into a virtual space with 100%, you know, of what we use. Oh, yeah, like it's like it's all right there for us. And it's all... Uh you know it's not something where it's like okay when when this class is over and when you get home i want you to do everything that we learned in class you know it's like that there's that whole kind of uh barrier you know yeah the log the the lag time between mm -hmm. critique and creation is a lot smaller in an online format you know like i can i can pull one of my students scores you know i can download it open it up, share screen, 
and immediately start editing and, and trying different, you know, um, different suggestions. What if, you know, what if we voice in drop two here? You know, what if we use spread voicings here? Oh, we don't like spread voicings. Okay, that's okay. Let's try, you know, a corral voicing instead, right? Like we can, um, we can demo things way faster in this uh, approach for composition, you know, in that example. That's it's awesome. Way faster, way faster than if we were in the classroom and I was writing stuff on the board and then you can't hear it or, you know, I'm demoing at the piano, but, you know, it's not. Yeah, it seems like there's a faster, just a faster reception of information that you get from the teacher and you can't like, it's not like there's ever, there's a teacher per student there is in class, you know, but this kind of just makes it a little bit more compact and a little bit more uh facilitated and narrow i suppose so i could see how that that's really beneficial yeah. e even for a student you know out of the students that i've talked to they've it's been i mean yeah it's just been awesome having to stay home at school you know not having to go to class all the time but uh even in the case that um their workflow and being in control of like their environment and like having to yeah all this kind of lag time of having to get from point a to point b and like being every having to be able to do everything just right here at home has just kind of been easy for them and uh, as long as they can somehow find a way to carry on with how they turn in their like performance videos or whatever and kind of just like navigate through what the program calls for from this online format then they seem to be doing like a decent job and it hasn't been something that has been like just a god-awful experience you know so and hopefully, yeah, as we've kind of talked about, we'll kind of like going, moving into the future, some of these aspects will be kind of implemented and we'll see how they can kind of fit when we can go back into like a physical offline teaching environment. For sure. I mean, I'm very excited to bring, you know, some of what I've learned in the virtual setting back into the classroom. Uh, because I don't want to just go back to the way things were before the pandemic. Uh, to me, there are, you know, definitely measurable improvements that, you know, at least I know I've made as an instructor with this form, you know, with this setting. So I, I, I definitely want to, you know, go back to, you know, in-person classes when it, you know, becomes safe to do so. But the, like what I'll be bringing back is going to be changed and modified as a result of these experiences for right. sure for sure and uh, i think like being thrown into the situation where you have to adapt and make sure that you can kind of navigate through without things falling apart is revealed yeah some of these silver linings in which you can uh it almost kind of like calls for like a like a, a harder discipline on on teaching and studying but also something that is kind of necessary you know to figure out how to keep on you know make sure that we don't all give up on music just because we can't play right make keep it on going so um yeah i i think it's like super interesting so <clears throat> Anyway, let's move on to the next thing I want to talk about, which is uh, I wanted to talk about teaching a little bit because I just recently started uh, teaching at Guitar Center. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask about teaching is this question is I wanted to know the difference between a lesson and some friendly advice. Totally. Well, I mean, I think uh, to me, a lesson is a contract, right, between you, the instructor, and, um, you know, your student. Um, you know, a lesson to me has sort of um, contractual implications in terms of, you know, we're going to have a lesson of this length. Um, perhaps we're going to address, you know what I mean, maybe some specific areas that you're looking to work on or or maybe you're looking for me the instructor to provide a framework within you know within which the student is going to to um, be practicing essentially um, and, and and a lesson has an agreed upon rate you know there's a 
to me that, you know, there's an exchange of, you know, your knowledge and time, um, you know, for either, you know, money in most cases, or, you know, some sort of exchange of goods or services. Um, you know, I know a good friend of mine took lessons with a really famous musician for, for a summer, uh, yeah. in exchange for mowing his lawn, actually. So it does happen. <laughs> There's That's... just a little bit of a Miyagi thing going on. That's awesome. Um, but to me, you know, a lesson, uh, you know, a lesson context has, you know, a set of agreed upon parameters. Um, and, you know, if you if you deviate at all, you know, it needs to be, you know, with open lines of communication, essentially. To me, you know, advice giving, I mean, you know, happens for me every single day, right? And, you know, it can be in the context you know, of like that lesson environment, you know, you, you can have students, you know, asking you questions during the, you know, during the week leading up to your next lesson or, you know, um, later that evening, you know, following a lesson, that kind of thing. Um, uh, or it could be from prospective students, uh, right? You know, people who are seeking your advice, but perhaps, you know, haven't started up, you know, uh, a relationship with you in terms of, you know, joining your studio. And, um, you know, I'd say, you know, obviously that information is, is more casually uh, distributed, you know, and I think, you know, it has to be at your own discretion in terms of like how much uh, time and attention you want to, to give someone, you know what I mean? Um, Before it's deemed a lesson where you'd find that like, Hey man, I just spent like, 40 or 50 minutes of my time that I could have basically just deemed a lesson, you know, that it was exactly what I'd be doing in a lesson with somebody. So, um, but yeah, it's like finding that kind of like selling point for yourself. How much do you know about your craft and how much you charge for it? And, but also how much do you want to give away to just some random person? You know, that's, that, that's, that's finding that, that, that's, that ground, you know, that line where that, that that's what this question is. Yeah. Kind of trying to figure that out. But so, so thank you a lot, you know, for that insight. Totally. I mean, you know, I think, and it also, I think has to come with a grain of salt, right? So for instance, you know, you have someone asking you an extremely detailed question that, you know, just by looking at it is going to take, you know, a substantial t- amount of time to respond to. I might say, Hey, I'm happy I'm happy to answer this question, right? Like this is obviously like evidence that you're really interested in getting better at music. You know, I, you know, I honor that in, you know, in your pursuit. Um, but I don't have time outside of a lesson format to answer it. Right. So, you know, I, Hey, like if you want to like take a lesson, like we can spend an entire hour answering, you know what I mean? Just on that one question alone. Right. And you can use it sort of more as like a, an advertisement, you know, in in that regard, you know, another way to handle that too, would be to answer the question, give a really detailed response. And then, you know, should they ask another question or you could just end your response with, and if you want more, we could, you know, do a lesson together. Right. Mm -hmm. Or even a third alternative would be to say, I'd be happy to answer this question in a free demo lesson. And yeah. if, if you like the answer and you like working with me, then we could continue in like a paid lesson format. Right. Uh, really also just kind of so, sometimes they might not even know that that's something that, Hey, I'm, I mean, it's not like we're wearing signs that say we're music teachers necessarily. Right. And, um, yeah. I mean, it's up to you to draw those lines, right? Like, I mean, it's not, it's not incumbent upon a student, right, of music to, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, obviously, like, we live in, in a mostly free information age, right. you know, 90% you know, of, of all information is freely available mm-hmm. at the click of mouse, right? So I, I think it's it's probably unrealistic to expect students who are accustomed to kind of getting almost instantaneous access to a lot of people, like most people on planet Earth and most information that planet Earth has to offer, right? 
And then, you know what I mean? Like you can't expect them to be thinking, oh, uh, so Connor, how much do I charge? You know, do you, do I pay you for this answer? Right. It's not it's like not necessarily a business radar. transaction. It's not on their radar unless, yeah. unless you bring it up to them. Right. Like, right. And, and of course, like if you're willing to answer, you know, uh, you know, whole lessons worth of information for free, like, you know, without saying anything, you know, you can't suffer in silence, right? right. You clearly express and delineate your approach and what works for you. Um, and, 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 you know, some people will leave, you know, will leave you like, you know, some people are going to just go somewhere else. Right. But a lot of people, I think, respect that, you know, what I mean? they respect openness and honesty and, and you might, you know, as, and as long as you're, I think, you know, empathetic, right? Like you, you know, you convey, you're, you're talking on an emotional, not just like a, right. Con- cognitive level i think people you know resonate with that great that, that, that's awesome you know and it's all about kind of just making sure that it's not just this feeling of like a business transaction and making sure that i don't know everybody's kind of being treated with quality and fairness so um absolutely anyway i'm uh i'm gonna have to kind of wrap this up so i want to bring this to my last point uh, that I wanted to talk about. And I just kind of wanted to talk about the future and where you see things going for just yourself right now, the music that you're playing, the music that you listen to, musicians in general. What's all going to happen, do you think, because of this pandemic thing that's happened? You know, is music just going to die off or is it just going to become like a hobby kind of thing? What's What's going to happen, you know? That's kind of like a final wrap up question, just the future. Ooh, okay. So, well, yeah. Well, I'm going to separate it into a couple of different categories. Um, regarding the pandemic, I think, you know, that we are, we're at the beginning of the end in terms of the, the pandemic. And what I mean by that, just very simply, is that, yes. The vaccine is here. Yes, we are vaccinating people. No, I don't think that, you know, we're going to fully get back to, quote unquote, the way things were in terms of like, you know, live performance practice in 2021. Uh, you know, the reason being just be- is because a-, a lot of venues have closed all over, you know, the country, you know, here stateside and then globally. Um, that infrastructure has taken a huge hit during the pandemic. Um, A lot of places, you know, um, you know, under the arena level, right? So uh, under the the Live Nation status, right? The the Justin Timberlakes of the world touring arenas, right? Not that, not at that level, that's corporate owned. But below that, you know what I mean? Uh, Essentially, thousand, thousand seat venues, and, and all the way down to you know, standing, you know, in, in, you know, a quasi garage somewhere. Yeah, Those mom and pop owned, you know, individually owned venues, you know, have really suffered um, and have gotten very little support. Again, you know, industry wide, not not that there aren't instances of of bailouts or, you know, Kickstarter kind of campaigns, that kind of thing. Absolutely. So 2021 to me, I think, you know, is a bust in terms of like the full, the full return of the live performance scene. I think, you know, things are looking up for 2022 and, you know, to, to any like people looking to, you know, for instance, put on, you know, their first regional tour, you know, or their, maybe even their first national tour, I'd be aiming for, you know, sometime in the, the early to mid 2022 to try and launch that mostly because you won't know until then what venues made it you know what i mean like actually made it through the pandemic until then right um because i don't think we're gonna have like no holds barred you know like totally unrestricted meet you know meetings of like larger than you know 10 to 15 people in person until until a, literally a full year from now. That's just my personal opinion. And I hope I'm wrong, um, you know, but I, I think by all indications, uh, we're, 
we're at the beginning of the end, not the end, not the end of the end, unfortunately. Right. Pandemic. Uh, is music going to be a hobby? No, I don't think music will will ever, you know, not be monetized, you know, or in other words, that I don't think that the professional of professionalization of music will completely evaporate. I do think that the pandemic has had winners and losers, though, and essentially non affiliated, you know, uh, artists, you know, artists who are not backed by major labels have been hurt the most, obviously. Um, and so I think it's going to continue to be diff difficult for artists in, uh, in non commercial genres, and artists uh, who uh, play, perform, you know, and compose music that's, you know, off the beaten path in some way, right? Uh, you know, cre you know, creative music, music that's not made to be consumed, right, as a product mm -hmm. is, is gonna, con you know, I think, be a really difficult enterprise, you know, that being said, it was a <laughs> really difficult, and I mean, it's always and it's always been a really difficult enterprise. Um, and so I think that, you know, heightened streaming, for instance, you know, the I, I, I would say the virtual, digi you know, complete digitization of music at this point, you know what I mean? How many people are really buying LPs, CDs and cassette tapes at this point, like physical copies of music at this point? I think the pandemic really put a damper on that. Yeah. Um, you know, almost killed that industry, I would say. Not that it's dead, because it's not, you know what I mean? You can definitely still get albums printed. It's just that I think, you know, a huge majority of the global pop population is streaming or, or downloading music right now. Just again, as a result of the pandemic. So um, that being said, right, I mean, that, you know, sort of outlook is not great. On the other side of the equation, though, people are donating, you know, um, like Patreoning, you know, becoming patrons and buying merch at unprecedented rates, right. all levels of the music industry. So not, I mean, not just like, you know, Britney Spears, but like, you know, um, you know, and just everybody, your neighbor. A or lot of, right? I mean, like, you know, at, at every level of the music, people. Mm -hmm. We're seeing, I think, an unprecedented level of direct, you know, one-to-one -one engagement with artists and bands. Um, and I think, you know, now more than ever is like the time to get that like t-shirt design printed or, you know, to get that mug, you know, um, onto your website or onto Instagram, whatever, you know, whatever outlet, you know, digital yeah. that you use. For sure. Uh, promote yourself and just do do it if you can't you know do whatever you can well i mean there's a services now too where you don't actually have to um like order it in bulk like you know you can upload the design and then people can order it and you just receive a, a you know you receive your commission essentially awesome that's awesome there's some really i think great opportunities to you know that lessen the upfront expense of merch and uh, heighten your ability to um, create a revenue stream for yourself. Right. And I think I think everyone should be doing that because I think it just seems like people are looking for ways to to help artists right now. Right. And if, I mean that you can't be helped if 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 you you're don't not doing them. you're not doing anything to be if, helped. If you don't if you don't give people a way to help you, then. <laughs> can't be upset if you aren't being helped right? absolutely absolutely so i think on that merch front that's like i think and and sort of that really creative i mean pairing your music with something else right that is purchasable i think is a real you know sync you know sync royalties and the like i think that's a really exciting way of getting your your music connected to something right does still have uh you know a value a monetary value in our culture today so i think that's really important and then there was one more component of this question i for, i'm sorry i forget what it is now hmm. the whole question 
Oh, for me personally. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's yep. So, um, well, I'm hoping to be back next year uh, as director of jazz, University of Utah. So, you know, on the teaching front, hoping that I can stay in Salt Lake and be engaged with the community through through that position. Um, on a um, you know, on a creative front, I'm working on a new album called um, "The Endurance of Optimism." Great. Uh, and I'm also working on a um, new set of um, uh, yeah, a new, a, a new set of books, essentially. Um, one of which I mentioned at the beginning of this. Um, yeah. Um, and this, uh, and the other um, is uh, essentially a collection of etudes and, and like broad, broadly speaking, an approach to voice leading chords on the saxophone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in other words, um, looking at um, how to take uh, multiphonic fingerings and essentially chords, you know, um, on the saxophone, vertical, like multi note structures played on the saxophone and voice lead with them. Right. Um, is is a real goal of mine uh because essentially i've always secretly wanted to be a guitarist so uh, yeah, <laughs> trying to yeah. try to kind of uh channel the the guitar a guitaristic approach on the saxophone has been a real goal of mine through the pandemic and i'm hoping that i can share what i've learned um you know over the next you know six to twelve months so Awesome. Yeah, we'll keep an eye out for that, you know, and uh, the endurance of optimism, how well, you know, where are you as far as coming along with that? Where is that in the process? Um, a lot of sketches right now. Um, nothing fully crystallized at this point. Um, you know, I have, um, I would say, a couple, a couple of main motifs that I know I want to sort of recur in different ways throughout the album um right. but uh you know we're we're in sort of more of an exploration stage right now um interesting i'm definitely taking my time with it just because you know i really want to have the band in one place in the studio to record the album right um because i just think that um, I want it to essentially be a celebration of the ability to do that in a certain yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, no, that's... So I'm, waiting, I'm waiting for, you know, for the ability to do that. Um, and in the meantime, I'm just kind of like savoring the, you know, the uh, the process, uh, you know, compositionally and and um, and technically, you know, like working, working mm -hmm. on my instrument um, for when I get the opportunity to do that. Oh, great. You know, so that's seems like you'll be pretty busy, you know, for the Always. <laughs> few kind of things. I, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm going to try and stay busy, too, but I, I'm going to be around, you know, hopefully if there's anything that is going on locally that I can contribute to safely. I know that sometimes there's like I think David Halliday is playing with a house band on Hop at Hopkins on like Tuesday or Wednesday or something like that. There's always just, I don't know if there's any little thing I can kind of do to just support somebody, go out and see somebody if it's safe or support online or, um, or is the school having any kind of online performances or anything like that coming yeah. up? Yeah. So, um, Essentially, the jazz ensemble is on like a monthly schedule. We're we're trying to record a composition a month, and so hopefully, um, in the coming weeks, I would say like the next like two weeks or so, we should have our first recording out um, from this you know first recording session process. Uh, but essentially, as we're as we're completing material, we're just going to be pushing it out on social right. media. You can follow us at the University of Utah Jazz Studies fan page. I'll definitely, yeah, I'll definitely wanting to be sharing that and having this shared on those pages. But uh, yeah, this this whole thing that's uh, been, been really helpful for me, you know, I think uh, that this whole episode is going to be really interesting for a lot of people. 
Um, so I just want to thank you for your time. I think I'm going to wrap it up. So I'm really excited to hear what you've got going on with your friend Gustin. That was way cool, that music. Um, and keep my eye out for things going on with school. And I'll have to, you know, keep that in mind that you're working on a new album and see how that comes along. Right. But thank you so much, Don or Dr. John Petricelli. Your name's not Don. <laughs> Dr. Petricelli, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Connor. It's such a pleasure to be a part of this series and uh and best of luck to you. You know, I'm I'm really excited for you to embark on this process and I'm really privileged to, to have an opportunity to join you here. So looking forward to the next episode for sure. Great. Thank you. Take care. You have a great evening.